Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Wassalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulillah Wa Ala Ali Wa Sahbihi Wa Min Wala Good evening everybody and we would like to welcome you tonight to our webinar the series that Dr. Hani started last year Fadfada, which is maybe op means open heart and uh, this year in uh, 2023 we're starting uh, some sort of engagement between Dr. Hani and some other colleagues from the sector so uh, we, they came up with something that uh, some sort of webinars to answer those questions. And we have with us uh, tonight our guest as well, Dr. Hassan Junaid, who is originally from Syria and is located in Gaziantep. So inshallah, I will start uh, with a brief introduction about our uh, major guest, our teacher, Dr. Hani Al-Banna, and then I will introduce uh, Dr. Hassan as well. And we'll give the microphone to Dr. Hassan to uh, give us some brief about uh, the webinar tonight, how the idea emerged, etc. And then we will go through, there is uh, in total 11 uh, questions, but uh, because, because in reality they are so deep and they include a lot of information and a lot of uh, issues which is related to the humanitarian action work, the charitable sector everywhere. Dr. Hani, tonight, inshallah, we will tackle four questions. We will give him 10 minutes for every question. And uh, by the end of our webinar tonight, we will open the platform for people if they have any intervention or any question to go through it. And uh, quickly, uh, everybody may know Dr. Hani. If for those who doesn't know him, he is uh, a medical doctor in a profession, which he left the uh, early 90s. Currently, Dr. Hani is the chairman of WAF, the World Humanitarian Action Forum, which is, was founded at the Humanitarian Forum in 2008 as an effort to support the collaboration of international organizations working with Muslims, NGOs, and communities. For those who don't know him, Dr. Hani is the founder of Islamic Relief Worldwide, and Islamic Relief is considered the largest Muslim international relief and development NGO in the West founded in Birmingham in 1984. Since Dr. Hani left the Islamic Relief, he founded the Muslim Charities Forum, which is a platform for Muslim NGOs in the UK, as well as we said, the Humanitarian Forum, and as we mentioned later, uh, developed to be the World Humanitarian Action Forum. Both organizations seek to foster closer partnership and cooperation between humanitarian and charitable organizations with Muslim countries and their Western counterparts. Throughout the years, Dr. Hani has been awarded so many honors. Uh, on top of them, maybe from El uh, Queen Elizabeth II in 2004, the Order of British Empire, the OBE. Later, he was awarded the Ibn Khaldun International Award for Excellence. And to be honest, if I need to go through his awards and honors, maybe they are unlimited. But the latest one is in 2020 when he received the Ubuntu Award for Social Responsibility from the Republic of South Africa. And uh, if you allow me, welcome Dr. Hani tonight. If you allow Hello, me sir. to go to Dr. Hassan, the second slide, please. It is a pleasure to have with us his, uh, here Dr. Hassan Junaidi who is currently the executive director of Busla Development and Innovation, which is an NGO based in Turkey. Busla provides comprehensive programs to equip the next generation of Syrian individuals from both gender and institutions with the knowledge and skills necessary to rebuild their communities. I can maybe doubt a little bit when we talk about Syrian individuals because I know Dr. Hassan is, mashallah, involved in so many countries in the area with Palestinian, with Yemeni, with Iraq, etc. So I presume it's not only the Syrian individuals. Dr. Hassan has been working in the humanitarian action work for over 10 years now. He previously was the capacity building director for an organization called The Trust. And then he worked as the Chief Development Officer and Deputy CEO for the Union of Medical Care and Relief Organization, which is known by USUM, where he was responsible for developing the capacity building designing strategy and establishing policies and procedures. Throughout the career of Dr. Hassan, he was able to design, facilitate, provide training and capacity building programs for several NGOs. 
He, mashallah, provided consultancies in project management, project uh, MD Pro, and organizational capacity assessment in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Palestine, and Turkey, as I mentioned earlier. Dr. Hassan has worked as a specialist consultant with multiple UN agencies, not to mention there are quite a few, OCHA, UNDP, etc. Also with international non-governmental organizations and humanitarian academic organizations based in several countries around the world. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hassan. And if I Thank allow you, me to put, the, yeah, to put the microphone with you, give us a brief about how this came up, etc. And then, inshallah, we come back to Dr. Han. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fadi, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Hani Al-Banna. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, as uh, my colleague uh, Fadi explained about uh, these episodes, uh, I would like to explain how the idea came to our mind. Uh, actually, I discussed with uh, Dr. Hani about some challenges and obstacles uh, in a humanitarian and development context, not only in Syrian context, but even so in Yemeni, Palestine, and Iraqi and uh, Libyan context. Uh, after I submitted my uh, questions, and I started actually only with uh, five questions, and later I collected all of these questions, and uh, it's up to 11 questions, uh, Mr. Dr. Hani uh, suggested uh, why we don't conduct a Zoom meeting and uh, try to answer all of these questions uh, as part of sharing lo uh, knowledge with all people who are working in the field uh, and at the same time uh, give opportunity for anyone who has uh, questions or maybe some obstacles or challenges in a humanitarian and development context to share with us and later uh, provide some answers or suggestion for these questions. Uh, today, as uh, my colleague uh, Fadi explained, we will try to answer on the first uh, four questions. And uh, at the same time, if you have any further questions, maybe we can collect from your side in uh, Zoom or even so in uh, the Facebook. And uh, we will try to put answers on your questions during the next uh, episodes. Now I will give uh, the floor to my colleague, Dr. Hani Al-Banna, uh, if you can start. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Hani, as we said today, inshallah, we will be tackling four questions out of the eight questions. And uh, for each question, if you allow me, we will uh, allow 10 minutes. And then, inshallah, we move to the other one as well. And then by the end, we give some time for people if they want to intervene or uh, ask questions. So uh, the first question, Dr. Hani, is how can everyone engage in any suitable civil society work, not necessarily engaging with any organization, any civil society organizations? The other question, how can we build the concept of trust with our society and become policy makers, influencers. The third one is, how can we always be impartial towards our society, not towards the tyranny of the dictatorship regime? How can the civil society work produce civil policies to manage and direct national elections, national economy, national education, etc.? And the other questions, I will go through them quickly, but we will tackle them in uh, further uh, webinars, how can an environment that arose under tyranny be a carrier of change, fa change factors? How do we ensure that we do not belong to one geographic region versus another geographic region? And number seven, how can we be careful not to, be, not to establish a humanitarian organization and then deny the principles of humanitarian action work? How can we not establish a media system to glorify a new tyranny? How can we not turn into, and this basically, uh, let me tell you a little bit quickly about Dr. Hani. Dr. Hani has this some sort of terminology. So we learn it from him and he will explain it more deeply uh, to us. Negonization, it means when the institution turns into a narrow elite that is somewhat separated from society's issue. And number 10, how do we make sure to break the emergence of different forms of tyranny 
And number 11, sometimes we find that the name of the institution is attributed to its founder and we still have the founders complex. And to be honest, don't look at it from only the East, it is everywhere in the world. The institution cannot merge with other institutions and cannot continue as we find that few founders accept to step aside to give way to new generation. So what is the solution? Back to what Dr. Hassan said, this is not the only uh, questions. We're happy to hear from you. We're happy to elaborate more on them. So now, Dr. Hani, the platform is yours. Okay. If we can tackle the first question, please. I, I think just to collect uh, question number nine, the organization or organization, I think there's a mistake, uh, Sister Aya, in the word organization, just remove the N. The last yeah, one- Yeah, it's my mistake. 11, uh, last one, number 11, is founder's uh, syndrome, not founder's complex. Founder's okay. syndrome. Uh, let us start to answer. How can everyone participate in any civil society uh, space, uh, any civil society space, uh, which is suitable to him or her? And this does not mean uh, participating in civil society organization only. Civil society work or civil work have two parts. One of them is organizational structure inside an organization. Inside organization. So if you go to, go to a social organization, humanitarian organization, developmental organization, political organization, economic organization. And this is to be in a structured organization. The second part will be through an individual response, which you call it the ad hoc, which is the largest. It's more than the first one. Many people are dealing with the second one, which is the ad hoc, the individual, the reactionary, and the emotional. Because this is a nature of the natural genetical creation of the man. Allah created us to love, to do amal al-khair, the act of goodness, of our khairat. That's why this natural genetical instinct is inside all the creation of God, including animals, birds, insects, and others. So two kinds of uh, intervention. One is structured, the other one is non-structured. The practical example of this, uh, when we look at our economy in the country, it has two parts. The state economy is made out of two parts. One part is the structured economy by the government or by the institution, which include companies, include businesses and others. The second one, which is the informal economy, which is more than 50 to 60, sometimes 70 percent percent in countries, which is like the salesmen and saleswomen in the open market on the street, the lollipop men and lollipop women, the coffee men and the coffee women are actually selling cash and coming to the door of, the, of your house. The second one is the non-structured, uh, is individually run, sometimes based on the initiative of the individual, but it's not formal, but it's constituting sometimes 50 or 60 in uncertain countries would go up to 70% of the national economy. It's becoming the ultimate right to whom? To any one of us. Any one of us, male and female, old and young, black and white, any citizen, to become a volunteer and to participate in any civil initiative, in any civil initiative, organization, or institution according to the principles, the values, the message, the strategies, the objectives, and the project requirement. Yani, since you since you uh, uh, register your organization as a registered charity, this gives the opportunity to any citizen to participate in your organization. It's an opportunity provided by the organization to employees. To, to, to come and take a space in the organization as a volunteer or as an, as an employee, it's an opportunity provided by the organization to employees and the volunteers. 
It is a positive, not inverse relationship. The more you give, the more you take. The less you give, the less you take. It is a positive, not inverse relationship between the organization and the citizens. The more the participation, commitment, dedication, loyalty, and efficiency of the citizens towards the organization, the more authority would be provided to them by the organization. Clear? Clear? Clear. Thank you. Next one. But let us discuss the understanding of the concept of civil society. Civil society has become a pain in the neck of certain governments, which is totally different. Two different and opposite to the military and the security. The civil society concept is totally different to the concept and opposite the concept of military and security. The latter, which is the military and security, is to protect the country and to protect the individuals from the criminals. The army or the military will protect the whole country from the borders, and the security will protect the individual citizen from the criminal actually who are attacking them. So, and none of them will be suitable to do the civil society work, neither the military nor the security, because they have not been trained or being equipped to do that. As for the principles of participation in any work, this is up to the volunteer and employees. If you want to participate, you have to exhaust your resources, you have to give time, you have to make effort, and you have to show the efficiency. Okay? He is the one, the volunteer, he or she, will be the one who determines his or her approval to accept the space. Suppose that the organization does not understand, does not understand or does not give you the space that you want. Sometimes you said, okay, sorry, so, sorry, it's not enough for me, and you leave, or you work more to try to convince the organization that, that you can do more and take more responsibility. He or she is the one who determined his approval or non-acceptable of the available work to him on the basis of which he or she will be patient and determined in order to obtain it. Here, he is the only one which as a volunteer, as a male, a male or female, actually, and the first and last decision to continue volunteering or working for them. And it's entirely up to you brothers and sisters, to accept the space given to you. But if you want such a space and responsibility to be increasing, you have to give more time, more effort, and show more efficiency. This was the first question, uh, Brother Fadi. Do you want me to go to the second one? Well, yes, please. We are going to go to the second one. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani. And to be honest, I would like to stress on the issues about the trust. It is an issue. People take it uh, not in a serious manner, but it is something I know uh, where Dr. Hassan came up of this question from his uh, field work, from what he encountered in the with other organizations as well, with individuals. And with your wisdom, Dr. Hani, we would really love if you can elaborate on it. How can we build the trust with our society and become effective influencers in policy making? We cannot build trust with others unless, unless, and put a big capital letters for unless, and many, many red letters, uh, red lines under unless. We apply the following measurements on individual relationship, or organizational relationship with the society. What is this? The first one is transparency. Transparency is the cornerstone of any trust building process between the individual and the society or, to, or between the organization and society. I mean transparency it could be financial, governmental, media, communication, accountability, all this. Such organization should be like an open book a book which be made uh, easy to read by anyone. This is number one. 
the organization opens its doors to anyone and everyone. They cannot say that you cannot come in or you cannot ask questions. Openness. The organization should be becoming credible and to be known in the society as a credible organization. Have policy of spending. Have policy of spending in place. Yani with the policy of spending that you don't overspend and you don't underspend. The economical way of saving money or saving resources. Having a known, valuable, clear, comprehensive history. Yeah. Each organization has to present its history to the public. To the public. To be seen as a transparent organization from the time of inception of the organization till the time of the people looking at the organization from inside or outside. The organization should, be, should not be classified having political attachment or ethnic uh, to, to a political party or ethnic group or sectarian or uh, to, to have this, all these sort of things not to be labeled by them. Having good relationship with all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, local organizations, local municipalities, councils, governments, social influencers, community leaders, local businesses, media, media platform, as well as others. Yani you cannot just become a public platform and you close your door in front of all this. No, you can't. Having social ambassadors for your organization to be in the public sphere, of the public domain, communicating, promoting, and defending the organization. Having developed effective and tangible social service, they know their program. They have seen your program. They have seen the service that you provided for the community in different places and different time. Not only that, solution that you provided to, to sort out some local problems. You have uh, services and solutions. Publishing periodical newsletters. Newsletters and uh, publicizing the organization news and the activities. And why you publish the newsletters? It is to show your program, show your achievement, as well as show your failure sometimes. Having very well designed, effective, and described succession planning. What do we mean by succession planning program? That means that nobody is indispensable, and no chairman should be a chairman forever, no CEO will be CEO forever, and no director will be director forever, and no, 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 uh, uh, no, no manager will be manager forever. And each one of them should be responsible to bring, educate, mentor, and coach the younger generation while he or she is in the office while he or she is in the office, to make the second and third generation while they are in the office. The organization should not be classified as political or ethnic, uh, just, uh, just, just serving ethnic group or sectarian or intellectual or religious to a certain group of people only. The organization should be having it is identity. Each organization of us should have its own character and identity. Should have its own character and character, character is the characteristic of its own character and identity. Its values, okay. its values, manners, social characteristics. The organization should be having its own respectable iconic. Each organization of us are producing icons are producing superstars. They should respect the superstar and the icon that they are keep producing. The organization at one time should have at least more than two or three generations, could be two or three generations. The elder generation could be the, the founders or the most senior. The middle generation could be the managers and the younger generation, which could be the younger generation, which could be prepared to become managers, middle managers and senior managers male and female, male and female, because people are quite often accusing most of churches of having no female leadership, unfortunately. Uh, the organization should show diversity and represent different society components, and should not be one color, should, 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 should include different cultures, 
different languages, different historical background from people themselves, different religion, different uh, uh, moral values. The organization should not become moody, erratic, and random in performance. And, oh, uh, the, the chairman wake up in the morning, have an idea, oh, let's do it. It doesn't work this way, and it will not work this way. This actually, the, the points, the points that uh, we need to put into uh, our table uh, as measurements before uh, building the trust with other, uh, with the community. We will never be influencer or effective unless we become, listen to this again, we'll never be influencer and effective unless we become, number one, hardworking and committed effective workers uh, and the organization. So our organization should be a hardworking organization, committed organization, and effective organization as individuals as well. Having research, having research and study centers. You listen to me, having research and study centers or even at least unit or even an individual to be responsible for research and studies. Having written policies benefiting the community. How can you become an influencer without having policy to benefit your own community or your own constituency? Having partnership and the coalition with other relevant organizations. You have to reach out with our community leaders, with our government departments, and the influencing personalities. You have to reach out with those people and those organizations to enable you to become effective influencer. Having, as I mentioned before, periodically community benefiting publication, this includes written audiovisual, the even drama. Why I put drama? Why I put drama? I put drama because drama could be more effective than a speech of a politician that a khutbah of an imam sometimes. That a lecture by a professor. Because it moves the emotion of the people and brings the facts on table for them. Having the organization's view on just issue. Just issue, if I can mention some of them, what's your view on what's happening in, in the Uyghur people in China, in the Rohingya people in Myanmar, in the Kashmiri people in India, in the DRC people in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, in, in what's happening actually in South Sudan, and what's happening actually in Palestine, what's happening, the actual long-standing problem affecting the Eritrean people who have been refugees in East Sudan for the last maybe 50 years. You know, all this kind of just or the issue of the uh, 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 children rights, actually, uh, not only children rights, uh, climate change, unemployment, the rights of refugees, the rights of IDPs, which are internally displaced people, all this kind of just of uh, uh, issue that you have to stand actually and have a written, a written, written volume uh, for it. Having written history, they. I'm keeping saying every day, every hour, every week, every year, keep writing your own history while you are in office as a policy of the organization. Otherwise, our history will be written by people who might fake it or might change it or might mutilate it. As we have seen, all the history written by foreigners nowadays is mutilating the characters of nations and people living at the moment. Having written a history for the organization describing its achievements. Having partnership program. But partnership is not just one off. It's a program. It's not a project. It's a program. A program. It is not an initiative. It's a program. Having the concept of community priority. What do you mean community priority? That actually you, pri you pri prioritize the needs and the, of the community ahead of the needs of the organization and the needs of yourself as an individual. Having a message which is institutionally society oriented. Your message is for the, for the society, not for your organization, not for your trustees, not for your board, not for your employees. 
since the purpose of its creation was to serve and find solution to different community problems. But we have to realize that our ultimate and final goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this in red, which I wrote, if we want to influence, we have to be affected by the, uh, if we want to influence others, we have to be affected by what is affecting others and measure what we do systematically and methodically. There is no impact without effectiveness and there is no effectiveness without impact. There is no impact without effectiveness and there is no effectiveness without impact. That's, that's, if, you become, if you want to become influencer, you have to create an impact and you have to measure the impact. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hani. We have already tackled the uh, question number two. And here I would like to ask Dr. Junaid if he has any intervention before I also have uh, would like to comment uh, briefly. And then before we put the question number yes. three, please just go for the question. Okay. Dr. Hassan, if you have any intervention, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fadi. Actually, I will ask uh, Dr. Hani and I will put myself on behalf of the community. Uh, and I will start with the last question and later I will get back to uh, the first questions. Um, my first questions, and actually I received these questions from our session, which we delivered in Arabic language uh, two days ago. As you know, the most of donors uh, doesn't uh, don't accept uh, to secure any fund for research and studies. Uh, how we can, as NGOs, to secure fund for these studies and research and research uh, that you mentioned uh, in your uh, answer in the second question. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, the if you like, you can answer, and uh, later I can mention the second one, Dr. Han. Oh. Uh, there's no influence we'll be, we will never be able to have any influence without having a document a document a research based facts document in our hand government does not listen to emotional speeches to a personal relationship no Institution does not believe in emotional speeches. No. You have to produce if you want to affect others. You have to produce what? You have to produce uh, written, researched, result, I mean, result oriented, uh, uh, research based document. Uh, you don't have to have a full department, but you can have one individual and you can communicate with an institution, which is a research institution, with academic institution, with universities, it can do it for you. You don't have to have big structured department, which might cost a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of time. You know what you have as an organization? You have the raw material, which is the most valuable part of any research document. So you can share the cost with other organizations. But without having any research, you will never be able to influence any decision maker or any community or any individual. It has to be fact, find, mission, research based. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the second question, uh, Mr. Hani, uh, you mentioned about uh, succession planning program. And uh, some founders or managers uh, asked us, okay, uh, I want to leave my position, but at the same time, uh, I don't have anyone who can manage my NGO. You would like to leave my NGO and at the same time to be destroyed or maybe to go back again uh, to the first step when I established what I have to do it in this case. The manager or the director, or the chairman, or the CEO, who does not create the planning while he is in office, he is himself as a failure. 
I have this experience when I visited uh, Fadi's country many times in certain areas. Whenever I go to them, ask them, what is your second generation? Sit yani are giving them time. I come after a few years, five, ten years, same, same answer will be. There. I told them, you are the failure. People could be ready when you make them responsible while you are in office. But when you leave the office and say that there's nobody there, it is one of the priority of the CEO, uh, chief executive officer, chairman, the directors, the manager is to be shadowed by young, young graduates and young qualified people, male and female, to learn from him or her so be prepared to become the next generation, actually a director or manager or middle managers or CEO or chairman. This is regarding okay. uh, that. So, but actually, okay. no. yes. Oh, okay. I finish. Yes. Fine. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. And thank, thank you very you. much, Dr. Hani. And to be honest, just quickly elaborating on the question number two. I know Dr. Hani is the founder of Islamic Relief. I was with him in the early days in the 90s, and he stepped down over 13, 14 years ago. The organization succeeded and uh, expanded into more territories. That means as a founder, as a builder, as a person who dedicated his time for it, he did work very well. This is how the organization were able to grow. And another organization which he stepped down as the chairman and he was the founder, the Muslim Charities Forum. So to be honest, he is giving us not only lecturing us, he is giving us an examples of how to run and manage organizations. And honestly, Dr. Hani's word in these few uh, slides are very important. In my opinion, I tell everybody, please write them down, abide by them. And I assure you, you will grow your organization because what Dr. Hani is mentioning is what we actually face with so many organizations nowadays, either in the field or even in donor countries, they, have facing, they are facing this such a situation and they are not actually following it properly and they actually complain why we are not growing, why we're having difficulties, etc. And finally, to be honest, Dr. Hani mentioned drama. And they say people remember how they felt and people don't remember what they heard. So it is essentially what he is mentioning. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani. And we are now again in front of another very important subject, which is impartiality. Can you please tell us, can we as a Muslim organization support non-Muslim people? And the platform is yours, Dr. Hani, to talk to us about impartiality. You can support anybody you want can support animals, existence, birds, climate, uh, habitat, uh, anything, anything. It's entirely anything moral that you can take forward and for your actually uh, platform and support them. Impartiality, impartiality. Uh, I will put some uh, points on what do I mean by impartiality and what I have felt by impartiality since the question is, is how can we become impartial toward the society that we serve, not towards the elite, uh, that government or our society, so towards the elite uh, that govern our society. Okay. Impartiality for me becoming يعني, you are not coming closer to uh, I, any of the conflicting parties. If you have got two conflicting parties, you should not become closer to one of them on the account of the others. You should distance yourself equally from both of them. You should become partially, unfortunately, unfortunately, patiently, not partially, patiently silent. When you are impartial, you don't open your mouth even if you see something which you don't like. Your tolerance should have no limit, limitless tolerance. You work for the continuity, continuity just to, to, of the life and the existence of the life, not development and productivity of life. Let them live. 
Forget about education. Forget about empowerment. Forget about development. Let them live. Not, not good enough. You realize that existence become a non-achievable aim for me. Even existence that we are actually talking about it, which could be looked at as negatively, it might not be achievable for certain uh, organize for certain people, as we see it in, in certain area in, in Rohingya, in Myanmar, or in Uyghur. Even their existence is not guaranteed, unfortunately. you will realize that the ceilings of your expectation will be lower, be far less than what is needed for sustaining the basic life of the affected community. Okay, you can eat one meal. You can still live in a tent for about 10 years, like actually in certain camps, in, I don't know how many camps, Assyrian camps inside, uh, inside Syria, brother, uh, Brother uh, Hassan, more than 1,000 camps or what? Uh, just your ceiling will be going down. You realize that living become an, ex an elusive, an elusive and an unattainable dream for many people, even just living. You realize that your opinion has no value anymore, unfortunately. They will only be taking talking about how to maintain unjust world system. The people's rights became elusive function as well. This is how I looked at the, what do you call it? Uh, how I looked at uh, impartiality. Dignity, pride, exaltation, and equality are not available for stakeholders. Dignity of a woman who wants to have a private place for herself, whether she's a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Dignity of, of, of a, a man who is actually begging for his rights. The Refugees Fund, which is a humanitarian response fund, is the right of every refugee or every internally displaced people. Or government. We might think all of that is a phase, just a phase. It will pass. No, unfortunately, it's a process in our life journey. It becomes a process, not a phase, unfortunately. A process, not a phase. This is actually some of my understanding of how can I see impartiality negative impact at the moment. These are some of the downsides that we can find when discussing impartiality. And at the same time, we can face more challenging as more challenges on the table. What is the definition of impartiality and who made the definition? Who created the definition? The Western organizations spend a lot of time and the effort to agree on a definition not only for themselves, but for all, all of us. Definitions, and listen to this very, very carefully. The people who are actually watching me on the Facebook. Uh, definition that reflect their culture, their culture, values, ideologies, philosophy of thinking, history, and faith. This is the absolute right, even if we disagree with them. This is the absolute right, even if we disagree with them. But let us ask ourselves a very simple question. Very simple question. To create or develop other alternatives, alternatives through research studies and fact finding results, unfortunately, big no, capital no, capital N and capital O. The English no, not the French no. Why? Because the leadership of the organization in the East, most of the organization and government and the government institution do not believe in research studies. 
That's why we cannot produce definitions. Do not, do not believe in invalidation and amendment. This is our problem. This is our big problem. The second point, the available separate separate space provided to the citizens. You find that in the West, the more separate liberty space provided for every individual. While in the East, less or none civil celebrity space provided for organization or for individual, unfortunately. That's why we cannot produce definitions. Number three, our current policies and the strategies is to face the status quo, firefighting, which means humanitarian response, fundraising, and program. No time for thinking, no time for researching, no time for actually empowering, no time for building community, no time, no fund. Our current policies are, and strategies are to face the status quo, which is firefighting from one side and from the other side to invest in fundraising and program and not investing in values, humanitarian principles, research and studies, philosophy, creating philosophy, creating culture, writing the history, and, uh, and, and, and moral values. This means that we became humanitarian, emotional, reactionary, not rehabilitational, developmental, critical, and analytical. This means that we became humanitarian, emotional, reactionary, not rehabilitational, developmental, critical, and analytical. The only excuse of the people in the East, including us here and some, some of the organizations in the UK, Muslim so-called charities, the only excuse was the increasing number of challenges facing the organizations in the East. I will tell you a verse of the Quran which I keep repeating it many, many, many times. A small group of people out of the bigger group should be specialized in looking at these points. At these points. If there's a big emergency, maybe 70, 80, 85% of the organization work towards the emergency. But 5 to 10% should be sitting back, thinking, directing, uh, analytically critical, uh, writing analytical, uh, uh, writing uh, critical analysis, collecting data, creating the vision. But we don't do that. We're not saying during the emergency, uh, just all of us to do 100% response or all of us or 50% of us should do the other uh, work. No, I said five to 10%. Number four, we have to believe in the concept of building partnership. This is another point, another point. Partnership with other relevant local organizations. Such partnership will become the foundation of successful outcomes for effective participation of the organization in society. Whether this is a local, small local organization, a small initiative, or big organization. The founders name organization, name and logo are tools. Yani, Sometimes the big organization insist on the logo, insist on the name of the organization, insist that the boss should be the one who is actually making the first speech. Reminding myself and others, all these are tools should be used by the organization. Number five, the community is the real owner. And I have to say that we are employee, employer, employees 
or are the employees by the employer. The employer is the poor people. The community is the real owner of the organization and their executive boards are merely executive organizational tools as the president, as the king, as the prince, as the chief, as the minister. They are tools to fulfill the community aspiration, which are countless. If we get rid of all this, with all these internal challenges, we know what will be? We will be We will be able to lead all the processes of local and international social movement. Say it again to let us to understand the value of getting rid of all these challenges. We'll be able to lead all the processes of local and international social movement. Not only that, but also we'll be able to lay down the new foundations of the new social path, pasarat, turuk, avenues, path for others to follow, and change the understanding, the principles, and the parameters of social and the material world. I'll say this again because this is extremely important. Extremely important. If we get rid of all these internal challenges, will be able to lead all the processes of local and international social movement. Not only that, but also will be able to lay down the new foundations of the new social path for others. Others want to do what? To follow, to follow us. And change the understanding, the principles and the parameters of what? Of the social and the humanitarian world globally. This was the third question. Shall I go to the fourth? <laughs> well, uh, we have like seven minutes of our time. I believe we can tackle uh, the... Uh, Dr. Hassan is suggesting that we take questions. Dr. Hassan. Yes, uh, Mr. Fadi. Actually, Mr. Hassan, in the Zoom, he asked uh, if he can ask uh, some questions to Dr. Hani. Okay. Mr. Hassan? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Wa alaikum salam. salam. Actually, first of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. Hani, Dr. Hassan, uh, Mr. Hani, for this, it's for your experience, for all these concerns, but I have like a few things to add if you just give me a few minutes. Uh, first of all, I have a question to Dr. Hani. When you mentioned impact and effectiveness, like impact is effectiveness, effective or impact is not achievable without effectiveness, effectiveness is not achievable without impact. What do you mean exactly? This is my first question. And then I have like a few comments. I'm not sure if you can agree on them or not. Maybe like you would like to answer this question first. I'll tell you something, Brother uh, Hassan. Hassan? Yes, Dr. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we build schools. We make water programs. We dig deep wells for what, isn't it? Many of them, is that right? And we leave and we never measure the impact when we come back after a year or two or three and see how this water program affected the community, had an impact on the community, changes the culture of the community, changes the level of participation of women in the community changing the level of understanding of the rights in the community, raise their economical status in the community. We just come, spend, give the money to organization, and spend the money 
and the donor leave without actually asking, uh, putting an extra fund to measure the impact. I will tell you an example which happened to us when I was in Islamic Relief. In Kashmir, in Pakistani Kashmir, there was a big problem on the mountains of having to collect water. The young girls used to go up and down the mountain three, four, five, six times every day to collect water from the valley. That means that the, the girl cannot go to school because she spent five, six, seven times to collect the water. When we started to build the reservoirs or the water tanks on the top of the mountain, the, 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 the girl stopped going up and down. And instead of that, started to go to school. The number of girls in the school increased. This number one, this is an impact, actually. The second thing is the woman who used to and wait uh, for hours to get the water from the uh, from the bottom from the valley. She used to have a lot of water in front of her house by the pipes coming to 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 her house. So she started to plant some. Uh, she started to produce some uh, uh, products, uh, uh, homemade products, which can sell in the market. So the economy of the of, of the of the of the family increased and yeah, improved, so improved, and so on. Something like this, this is to measure the impact. This should be put inside the cost of the project. And if the project is costing one million dollar, maybe to add another hundred thousand or fifty thousand or seventy thousand or one hundred fifty thousand to actually measure the impact of how did you spend the uh, the the one million dollar on education or in water and sanitation or in actually uh, 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 local economy. This is okay. to measure the impact. Thank you, Dr. Hani. Uh, okay, Hassan, you. I will allow you just one minute. We have we are our session is one hour and we still have one uh, question to go through. So I will allow you one minute, please. Ma'am, I just want to comment on the. Uh, how can we build the trust with our society? I think it's an ongoing process um, 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 that requires consistency and persistence over time. Like for me, I think, I'm not sure if Dr. Hani agrees with me, engaging the community, and I'm speaking about um, what I have seen in the past few years. A lot of NGOs, they do not engage the community. They do not seek input and feedback from the, from the community. Uh, they need to actively involve them in decision-making process that affect them. And the NGOs, they need to lead by example, like model um, ethical behavior and integrity in, in all actions, both within the organization and in interactions with the community. Um, this is one thing regarding the last question, like becoming impartial towards the society that, that we share. I think the most important thing is like um, uh, involves us to be objective, unbiased, and fair in our actions and decisions. We need to understand our own biases because everyone has their own biases and prejudices. It's important to be aware of them and to take steps to mitigate them. And um, it's, um, as well, it's an ongoing process that requires continuous effort and self-reflection. Even with the best um, intentions, it's likely that we will make mistakes and have biases that we are not aware of, you know, like this happens. So thank you, thank you, thank you, brother okay, Hassan. Uh, uh, brother yeah. Hassan, thank you very much. To be honest, your uh, comments are really to the point. Thank you very much for them. If you allow us to continue with Dr. Hani, so because we have already we are already exceeding our time. But really, to be honest, your contribution are really important. Thank and you, and I do Hassan. agree with them. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hani. Yeah. yeah, question number four is we're we'll talking about producing policies, organize and review the process in terms of like general ed ed election, etc. I just want to comment uh, one thing with the question number three, you are telling us to be uh, policy makers, to be influencers, to be leaders in the charitable sector. We have to be uh, proactive and not be reactive as unfortunately the situation is, uh, the, is the current situation. Yes. So if we continue with you, Dr. Hani, with the question okay. number four, 
how can the civil society produce civil policies to organize, to organize, manage, and review the process of general election and, 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 and. Let me take you with me to what do I mean by civil society. Civil society is the nation. Civil society is the country. Civil society is the government. Civil society is the state. It is the bedrock of all this. It's the bedrock of all this. And listen to what I'm going to say about the, four, the first four lines. The state, the country, or the government that does not believe in civil society and support its developing processes through its long-standing journey and the establishment of its civil sectors and organization is a fragile state. Living in unconscious country, government governed by a clinically dead government. Can I say it again, Brother Fadi? You like this statement? I know that you're laughing now, your own old laugh. The state. I'm listening. Sorry? I'm listening. Okay, I am not laughing. <laughs> the state, the country, or the government that does not believe and civil society and does not support its developing processes through its long-standing journey and the establishment of its civil sectors and the organization is what is first of all a fragile state living in unconscious country governed from but governed by not from governed by a clinically dead government Civil society and its independent organization can deal with all this and more. What evidence? Somebody might tell me, uh, you are very emotionally excited about protecting or of protecting a civil society. I'll give you some example. Hassan is one of the Syrian brothers who is a refugee now in Turkey. Isn't it our brother Hassan? It's Syrian Syria refugees. And in their displaced refugees, Syrian refugees, what they have done? Hundreds of organizations are doing incredible work in Turkey. Less in Lebanon and less in actually Jordan. Here's the answer if we provide the necessities for human beings in a safe atmosphere, we will enable. We will, enable, we will enable them to produce, to be innovative, pioneering, technically advanced, civilized, uh, and astonishing processes and products benefiting and surprising all the country. And if we provide this civil, civil space, civil liberty space, and safety to any individual in any part of the world, he will be innovative. She would be innovative. And this is what happened to the Syrian when they went out from a less civil liberty space inside the country to a better civil liberty space in different countries. And they produced wonders. This again will prove that. This again will prove that. Human being can use his or her, uh, her deeply hidden faculties that were inherited from our father Adam. To Surah Al Baqarah, Ayah 13, verse 31. Uh, Allah has taught Adam all the different names of what? The different names of what? Of necessary sciences and technology to enable Adam and his children to discover the wealth on earth and in the depths of earth and everywhere else. Allah told the angel to deal for Adam. Or any khalif, the general for Ard Khalifa. I am going to put a custodian on earth. 
and they started to respond to Allah in not in a in a positive way. Then Allah went to teach Adam the names of all the subjects, the science, the technology, the knowledge to enable Adam to be the master of humanity. And he put this in front of the angels. They failed to respond to that. This names of science and technology and other things is here. You know, each one of you are watching me today has this is being inherited from Father Adam thousands and thousands of years ago. That's why it's in us. All these faculties as are in us. The civil society activities are closely, closely cutting. Closely, not closely. C-R-O-S-S-L-O. The civil society activities are closely cutting all different societal components. The civil society activities are closely cutting all different societal components. They're actually affecting every constituent of such components or such society. And it begins with the leader of humanity, the human being, then followed by other, by the reaction of other creatures helping him or her to build the protective and sustainable society. And when we look at the civil society as a sector or as a cross-cutting, it's cross-cut everything, every component, every activity, every structure in any society. Because it's civil. Civil means human being, means individual, means citizen. The civil society work is an, 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 an individual. Individual work, but natural. And fitri. Fitra. Fitra. Natural nature. The natural nature which is put in the heart and the mind of the man. That man, uh, the, 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 the creation of God. An individual but natural. And it could be community and structures, as I mentioned earlier on. It could be structured, created by the community. It reflects the natural development of the ability of the sound and the nature of the human that will be to cope, will be able to cope with the natural and random societal developmental growth. Yani this kind of nature will meet the natural development of the society as well as the uh, unnatural, which actually is a uh, random developed uh, uh, incident inside society, like after after volcano, after uh, earthquake, after flooding. This is not natural development of society after destruction, after war. Civil society work may be individual because of its innate, and it may also be collective and the institutional because it reflects the natural developments of the ability of common sense of man, of the common sense of man, to keep pace with the natural and random growth of society. And here, to balance between the natural growth, which is developmental, and the random growth of the society. Therefore, civil work, which is charitable and charitable and social, is an instinct. A need is an instinct, is a need, mean, rule, basis, banner, behavior, interwoven, and divergent path, culture, thought, philosophy, climate, and this, all this and more. If you look at it, actually, when you see the slide, it could be all of this and more as well. This is the same slide. Can we survive without civil society work? Yes and no. Yes, without, because a lot of countries have got this restricted civil liberty space. 
seven level space or the non-existence of seven level space but they still on an individual basis do the civil society work yes for those who are fighting uh, against its existence and development who are suffocating it is breathing climate and reducing its civil liberty scope from the impact of those tyrants. When such tyrants succeed in doing what has been mentioned earlier to a civil society, such civil society organization will never become institutional and then instead it will be individually, randomly, and actually led, but will not be wiped out from society because it is uh, because of the nature of your mind. In a, in a dictatorship, tyrant regime or tyranny, they might not be able to develop the, uh, the organization into a, the level of, of, of organization, but to become an individual reaction or very undeveloped organization. But it will never be taken away. Because what? Because of the nature of man. But societies, states, and nations will not be able to develop themselves and the flourish unless we create independent civil society sectors and organizations. Such sector and this organization will be able to explore and discover the deeply creative pioneering faculties of humanity. Thank you. Back to Khfadi. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hani. Thank you for all the answers uh, on these uh, important questions. And thank you for Dr. Hassan for coming up with these questions and actually uh, like putting uh, forward to you and uh, to chat, to sharing with all, everybody watching us today or maybe in the future watching the uh, webinar. It is really important. I, to be honest, I can feel uh, where you're coming from, Dr. Hani. We have been together to, for a long time. We've traveled together. I know the pain you are talking about. I know how important every single word in this presentation is. I know these words, to be honest, are really policies. I've seen it by my bare eyes. I am seeing it, to be honest. I'm now in Lebanon visiting different organizations. I'm seeing it by my bare eyes every day with organizations, how it is important. They ask me simple questions. I can see all the answers in the presentation you have put uh, for us. Thank you very much. And as we said in the beginning, this is not the end. This is just uh, some of the questions that we are uh, we have gone through today. More coming, inshallah, with the Arabic webinars and also followed by the English webinars uh, with more questions as well to tackle. They are really important, just like today. Uh, finally, I will, uh, if Dr. Hassan has anything to say, and you, Dr. Hani, and then we, inshallah, close. Dr. Thank Hassan. you, Fadi. Thank you, Dr. Hani. I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. Dr. Hani, if you have anything to say, I'll take a look at I don't know what to say. I spoke too much, and uh, but to be very honest, uh, now the challenge is for the existence of civil society space for civil society organization and civil society. Uh, because we see a lot of uh, newly developed or uh, established uh, military regimes or security regimes and military and security do not believe in civil liberty. Actually, this becomes a uh, uh, strangulation to the souls and the minds of the free thinker and the liberal uh, thinker and the civil workers as well. And the governments are or actually, uh, governments can be run by military or security. Uh, government has to be run by civil individuals. 
state has to be run by several individuals. And pioneering only come when we have freedom, when we have several, enough civil liberty space for every one of us to be able to reach his or her potential, to feel safe and free. As the Prophet said, من كان من بات آمنا في سربه معافا في بدنه عند وقوت يومي كان كأمنا ما حيث تاو الدنيا Those individuals who sleep safely in their dwelling يعني in a flat, in a room, in a house, in whatever you call it healthy, have their food ration they are if the, if the whole world is favoring them to others but the most, the first one was or is safety aminan fi sarbi and here this could not be found in a dictatorship uh, regime or in a country run by security or run by military that's what i want to say thank you very much dr hani thank you for everybody for who watching us tonight or may watch it uh, later uh, and we hope to meet you again in another episode of uh, fatfada and we meet you with uh, more questions to answer assalamu alaikum good night everybody from everywhere in the world